Welcome to the course on Foundations of Cognitive Science. In the last lecture, we have talked about one of the very important smart materials which is needed, which is essential for organismoid robot development and that is shape memory alloy. Today I will talk about another interesting smart material which is based on polymers and it is uh, predicted that this is the smart material which will be inevitable in terms of development of cognitive robots. So let us uh, have a very good discussion on this type of polymeric smart materials today. Today we will talk about the electroactive polymers which is also abbreviated as EAP. Now these electroactive polymers they belong to the smart materials group which is commonly known as active smart polymers. So what are these active smart polymers? Well, the polymers that respond to external stimuli by changing the shape or size actually known as active smart polymer. So the output has to be a change of shape or size and the external stimuli could be of different types. In fact, the best way you can differentiate between the external stimuli is that whether it is electrical in nature or non-electrical in nature. With respect to these, there are two categories of these active smart polymers. The first group we will call them to be active polymers which respond to non-electric input stimuli such as pH, magnetic field and light. One of the example is polyanionic cellulose. Electric field based actuation of polymer is an even more important step in terms of polymeric development because you can easily apply electric field on a polymer instead of uh, using other stimuli like let us say uh, light or uh, you know some chemicals and things like that and hence electric uh, signal based or electricity actuated polymer is a very special class of polymer. This special group of polymer we will call them as electroactive polymers that respond to the change of electrical input. It is also known as EAP. Now one of the example of an active smart polymer which is not uh, EAP but simply active and that is a polymer here as you can see in this particular case and this is a based on azobenzene actually and there is a ring like structure you can see and this responds to uh, you know light specifically light or visible light or UV light and because of the presence of this azobenzene group in this case which actually contains NN double bonds, under visible light these double bonds have a cis configuration in which the polymer is bent. So this is the cis configuration you can see these active uh, groups, uh, azobenzene groups here which are bent. Now this is under the visible light. The moment we will apply UV on it, say 4 seconds you will see that this uh, part where the UV light is applied has become flat. Now once again, so that means the polymer will be flattening under the UV light. Once again you put it under visible light, it will start to bend and again if you apply the UV light in the next joint it will get flattened and again uh, so this is under the visible light and then the UV light it will uh, once again uh, it will get actually be flattened and again the visible light the bending will start. So that is how this whole ring can actually make its movement from one side to the other 
by successively making its joints, uh, con you know, transforming between cis and uh, trans configuration. So this is uh, an interesting case of an active smart polymer. Now, in terms of the electroactive polymers, if we compare the electroactive polymers with the other polymers like shape memory alloys and electroactive ceramics, you would see that electroactive polymers gives the maximum amount of strain. That is why we have the highest uh, actually uh, potential of application related to this. It gives about 10 percent of strain as you can see here. On the other hand, shape memory alloys can give about 8 percent strain and it has a short fatigue life also. So, which means you cannot really use it for a very long time. And electroactive ceramics that we have earlier discussed that gives a much smaller actually percentage of strain even though it does not have, it does not suffer from a shorter fatigue life. Now, the only catch is that the force is less here. For example, in terms of stress, maximum stress it can generate is about 3 MPa. Compare that with the shape memory alloys which has about 700 MPa and you can easily understand the changes. In electroactive polymers is somewhere in between it is having about 30 to 40 MPa. If you compare the reaction speed, the reaction speed is also equally fast like the electroactive ceramics that is between microsecond to second. On the other hand, the shape memory alloys are slower. They have second to minute kind of a actually reaction speed. Density wise, they are very low density. So that is why there is very low weight penalty by using this type of actuators. They are almost close to water, density of water. In comparison to that, SMAs are heavier, electroactive ceramics are also heavier. The driving voltage is not very high, it is about 2 to 7 volt, whereas for SMA also it is not very high volt, although it is not mentioned here. And electroactive ceramics, uh, it, it require actually quite a very high, large voltage. Now, in terms of the consumed power, you can see that these ones are having about milliwatts of power, whereas all others are required watts of power, which means this leads very low amount of power. Fracture toughness wise also they are resilient and elastic. On the other hand, uh, ceramics are very, very fragile. So, an overall comparison tells us that these kind of electroactive polymers are far better placed in comparison to the SMAs or in comparison to the electroceramics as far as uh, we are considering their application in terms of robotics, manipulation devices, etc. They also have a very interesting history of development. Let us try to see that how these kind of materials have evolved. We will talk about the evolution of electroactive polymer. Now, one of the very important name in this evaluation is uh, Ronzen. You know about Ronzen from his discovery of X-ray for which he got his Nobel Prize. Now, in 1880, Ronzen carried out a very unique experiment in which he has applied electric field through the thickness of a rubber band having one end fixed like this end is fixed and a mass attached to its uh, other end, the free end. And what he found is that as he is applying the electric field, the rubber band is thinning in this section. You can see that with the help of needle like uh, you know uh, probes, he has applied the electric field and it is thinning in this region and as a result of it, because the rubber is actually incompressible in nature, so the total volume has to remain same. So as it is thinning here, it actually expands in the longitudinal direction. So it is thinning and it is expanding, thickness direction thinning and it is expanding uh, in the longitudinal direction in order to keep the volume constant. So that was a very interesting phenomena that was observed and uh, uh, you know rediscussed by Keplinger uh, in this uh, very 
interesting PNAS paper in 2010. Now that uh, 1880 experiment possibly is the first on any electroactive polymer. It is also unique uh, uh, in terms of the experiment because in this case the rubber was you may say like a naked rubber. There is no electrode that was actually uh, there. So simply directly the charge is actually provided to the system. Now in such systems there is one danger however and the danger is also known as pooling instability. So what is this pooling instability? If I consider an elastomer actuator which is subjected to high voltage, the elastomer will thin down. However, the same voltage induces an increasing electric field in the elastomer and so an increasing attractive force between the oppositely charged electrodes. And this oppositely charged electrodes, they are basically bringing the two sides closer. So that is why it is called the pulling voltage. And at the pulling voltage, there is a positive feedback that will happen and the elastomer will thin down drastically. Finally, it will result in electrical breakdown of the system. Let us look into some of the other developments. So, as has been shown here by Keplinger uh, in his unique PNAS paper, that uh, you can actually develop a three dimensional structure based on an electroactive polymer, and in this, you do, you do not apply any electrode essentially because the electrodes will create the pulling instability. On the other hand, you apply high voltage to these needles, much the same way as originally rod gen had planned. Uh, had planned. So you apply the high voltage to the needle, and as you can see that as you are applying it, uh, there is uh, there is uh, expansion happening in the system, and uh, you can see that as you are increasing the voltage, you can almost get from an angle to a very flat structure. So this is something that is kind of a rediscovery of the Ron James experiment on an electroactive polymer. There are many other electroactive polymers which was discovered after Ron James discovery and interestingly each one of them has a kind of a 50 year approximately time of a frequency between successive discoveries. Let us look into those other discoveries of electroactive polymers. In the evolution of EAP, Iguchi's discovery plays a very interesting role. In 1995, Iguchi prepared a new material which is produced from natural resin, which is also known as uh, Brazil resin from Caranuba wax. So it's a Brazil wax, that's how it is generally known as, and beeswax. So he has mixed these two and where so these are solidified by cooling while subjected to DC bias field. And what he noticed is that in this kind of solid electrode, it will generate voltage when a stress is applied and it will have the reverse behavior of being deformed. So that is what was the discovery of the Iguchi of a new type of uh, uh, you know kind of a polymeric system which is a mix of Caranuba and the beeswax which actually shows a high degree of uh, deformation and also the other effect that is uh, if you um, you know apply stress you are going to generate voltage if you remember we call this to be a direct effect and we call this one to be a reverse effect so both of them Iguchi was able to discover in this particular material now followed by these uh, there are significant discoveries by Kawai in 1969 and uh, this is a entirely new uh, inorganic you may say not exactly you may say that synthetic piezoelectric material so this is a synthetic one because the last one that we had discussed was derived from natural organic material so this is a synthetic organic material which is known as polyvinyldene fluoride okay uh, in fact because of the presence of fluorine uh, some uh, it has some inorganic contributions but it's a synthetic essentially polymer so it's polyvinyldene fluoride and it has shown a large degree of piezoelectric activity. Now, at a later stage, Fukada actually 
developed piezoelectric biopolymers uh, on the basis of this PVD. Uh, another important landmark was uh, from the Kachalsky and his group in Israel who have developed actually responsive gels but these gels were mostly chemomechanically activated. So these are gel polymers and this uh, shows a very high degree of shrinkage or swelling that means there is a bulk volume change in the presence of an acidic or alkaline environment. Now joining these two concepts in 1980 Hokkaido University people have first developed responsive gels which are based on electrochemical activation and following that line subsequently Osada and Kisi has developed in 1989 they have developed polymers uh, which uh, can demonstrate very large strain under relatively low activation voltage which was followed by Bar Cohen in 2010 in terms of the development of electroactive polymers on a specific polymeric system called Napier. Now the question is where am I going to use this kind of an electroactive polymer? Why are they, why I am repeatedly telling that it is so important in terms of a robotic development? Well one of the very important application of this type of polymer is in terms of locomotive, locomotions or generation of uh, locomotive forces. So let us look into that how in robotics uh, you know gradually this transfer from motor to motorless locomotion has taken place. If we look into the animal locomotion based inspirations you will see that starting from the motor based rigid robots like this kind of a quadruped stair climber Titan 6 or a snake like SEM R5 or for that matter a bipedal walking robot M2 you have also seen ASIMOs which are all basically motor driven uh, some of them are servo motors uh, or other brassless DC motors but these are all motor driven systems but uh, taking inspiration from animal locomotions gradually these locomotions uh, uh, have been achieved by a different manner. This different manner is if you study the animal locomotion you will see that they essentially use muscles for actually motion and we will call it actuation. Now these muscles are attached to bones by the tendons and the muscles contract to move our bones by pulling on them. So you have to keep in mind that these muscles they can only contract and hence they can only pull, they cannot push. So that is one of the important aspect to be kept in mind. So this is why in any joint the muscles are used in pairs. One muscle of the pair contracts to move the body part and the other muscle at that time actually relaxes and later on the other muscle actually contracts to return the body part back to the original position. So the muscles that work like these are called antagonistic pairs. So we have basically two types of muscles called agonist muscle and antagonist muscle. Well, if you look at your own elbow for example, uh, what you will see is that in our own elbow, if we actually move our arm, okay, if uh, let us say that we want to pull our arm, you would see that this is the part which is actually pulling. So this is the part which is actually agonist, you know, the muscle and the back part is actually antagonist. So that is how the motion of this uh, joint is actually happening by uh, constantly the pulling of the two biceps and the triceps muscles. So it is a very similar kind of a concept that we will be actually applying uh, in the case of uh, the smart muscles also. Let us see how we can apply these antagonistic actuation by using shape memory alloy. Now here is an example in which uh, people have developed a shape memory alloy based you know you can see the agonist and antagonist motions. Okay? So the, whosoever is pulling 
is agonist and the other one is a relaxing so antagonist and look at the trajectory that it is creating so the other side you can you have seen that agonist and antagonist motion and you can see here that it's a nice rectangle that has been drawn very similar things is done for almost all our muscles okay and by varying these uh, pairs motion you can actually do it faster or slower there is another very interesting application of this agonist antagonist motion uh, by using actually electroactive polymers by a group uh, in Switzerland uh, EMPA group and they call this to be blimp so this uh, blimp is essentially a pressurized helium field it's a big fish it is like 8 meter long and it's uh, actuated by electroactive polymer using this agonist antagonist configuration and it is designed to work at various frequencies voltage and phase shift between the body and the tail actuation so you can see that this is a uh, 8 meter big and you can see these uh, muscles uh, you know which is and it's a very flexible inflated structure so first they are pressurizing helium gas into it and you can see that how these muscles are working here and you can see that by these uh, you know agonist antagonist uh, working of the blimps uh, EAP electroactive polymers how they are very nicely you know moving uh, in the tail as well as the body in the space and is generating the motion so this is in the laboratory you can see that how this motion is happening also they have tested such a system in outdoor so you can say that this is possibly the first organismoid robot which is a fish like robot which is based on uh, the muscles which are essentially bio inspired in nature you can see the electroactive polymers here so this is where they are actually testing this entire system uh, outside and you can see that how nicely this is maneuvering controlling its position so that's one of the example of the electroactive polymers now we will talk about some of the classifications of the electroactive polymers that they themselves can be grouped into two types electronic EAP which is driven by electric field or Coulomb force and ionic EAP which change the shape or by mobility or diffusion of actually ions so as the name itself is suggesting and uh, it is also uh, indeed true that electronic EAPs are much faster the Coulomb force based EAPs whereas ionic EAPs are actually slower because they depend on the mobility or the diffusion of the ions which is a slower process but of course they can generate a much larger change in the system in fact the last example that I have shown you is based on the ionic EAPs now electronic EAPs which is also known as EEAP they are like dielectric EAP one of the example another is electrostatic tip paper ferroelectric polymer and liquid crystal elastomer on the other hand the IEAPs are like ionic polymer gels ionic polymer metal composites like IPMCs napion uh, duponts flameon etc then there are some conductive polymers and even carbon nanotubes so these are the groups which shows the ionic electroactive polymer we will now focus on the ionic electroactive polymers because as I told you that they are the best performing material as far as the large deformation goes and also uh, as far as the power consumption goes they consume very little amount of power and so they have real future in terms of developing different types of motions in robotic uh, you know limbs or you know, so called arms and legs of a robot so let's look into the ionic polymer matrix composites or this kind of you know ionic electroactive polymers if I compare between the EAPs and IAPs that's what I was telling you that EAPs needs a high activation voltage whereas ionic EAPs need very low voltage 
and they have this EAPs have a high energy density and rapid response time in comparison to these IAPs have relatively slow response times but amount of deformation is much more and they perform better under wet condition. So if you look at one of these ionic electrolytic polymer which is IPMC that is ionic polymer metal composite the example here is the napier. Now this type of material they con actually consist of a polymer matrix which is sandwiched between two metallic layers. Now napier specifically is actually a pre-fluorinated copolymer of polytetrafluoroethylene or PTAP and a pre-fluorinated vinyl ether sulfonate. Now you have actually come across PTFEs uh, in your day to day life when we talk about non-stick pans etc. So PTFE actually gives the strength to the material. So PTFE is one part as I told you there is a copolymer. So one copolymers are made of two polymers. So one part is PTFE which gives the strength and the other part is this perfluorinated vinyl ether sulfonate. So this perfluorinated vinyl ether sulfonate is heavily fluorinated essentially and it has a sulfonate group. That sulfonate group is actually the source of uh, polarity in the system. And note down that this perfluorate group has OH minus in it. So it means that it has a fixed OH minus attached to it always. Okay. So this is so if you have a material which is, is a combination of the two and then if you put them in an electrode then you can actually generate a fixed negative charge in one side. That is what you know uh, is important in this kind of material. So you can see here that there is this electrode here and there are these fixed negative charges which is generated with the help of the sulfonate groups. Now, this fixed negative charges the moment I attach this uh, cathode what will happen is that the water molecules that is present inside the IPMC they will start to go towards massively towards this negative you know direction the cathode. So as there is the driving of the water molecules this side will bend if there are more water molecules one side will bend. Right? So from the, this one you are getting a bent Thing. And with respect to time, some water molecule will back diffuse, which actually talks about a relaxation. So a small relaxation will happen, but essentially you can generate a large bending in this kind of material. But of course, one of the precondition is that it needs to be wet, because then only the water molecules movement towards this uh, cathode will create this large hydrophilic expansion in the system. Now, depending on the type of electrodes, you can actually generate uh, the positive and negative bending in IPMCs. So, as you can see that this is a kind of a, a typical IPMC that is how it looks like under um, you know normal condition and under bent condition. And uh, you can get a large deformation out of this system and with a low actuation voltage and fast response. You can actually generate by changing two different types of electrodes on an IPMC, you can generate two different types of curvature signal. You can generate a downward and a, you know uh, this downward and an upward kind of curvature. So you can generate double curvature in the system by using two different types of electrodes in the system. So that is one of the advantage of the system. Now this kind of IPMC based actuators, they are used for single link manipulators, multi-link grippers, vibration generation control and 4 bar manipulators. So most of the locomotion generation can be done with the help of this type of IPMC based actuation system. So some of the applications you can see that like this is in terms of a dust wiper, you can see that how this uh, dust wiper actually works uh, uh, in terms of cleaning in fact large deformation and then uh, 
there are other applications also like this sample handling in robotics this I already told you in different applications are possible uh, particularly for the planetary applications people have already used this type of electroactive polymers. Now I will just conclude this particular session of the lecture by comparing because we now are in a process that we can summarize actually that uh, the different smart materials vis-a-vis -a, -vis a biological system in terms of their performance. So this is what we will be doing in the final concluding slides. If I compare mammalian skeleton muscles with initially the field activated electronic electroactive polymers and then we will compare them with the other groups of ionic electroactive polymers. Now the mammalian skeleton muscles they produce large strengths. How large? We always say large in the quantification here is about 20 percent and the stress is however moderate about 350 kilopascal. Stiffness can be varied but the fuel that is used in terms of the nutrition that is a high energy fuel. Efficiency is near about 40 percent and they have a good work density about 40 kilojoule per kg and they have a high cycle life because they can actually regenerate also. Disadvantage is that this type of material is not an engineering material and they have a narrow temperature range of operation in the high temperature they cannot work and they expense energy to maintain force uh, you know without moving so uh, that's one of the problem that they don't have any cat state. Now however interesting thing to learn is that they have a very interesting three dimensional system which integrates both the sensor, energy delivery, OST removal, local energy supply and repair mechanisms all in one pack. That is something that kind of a compactness we are still not able to achieve as far as the synthetic you know materials are concerned. Now let us look into the field activated electronic groups first among the synthetic materials. The first group is the field activated electronic group like PVDF high mechanical energy density, relatively large actuation force uh, in the me mega Pascal range can operate for a long time in room condition and rapid response about millisecond range and can hold strain under DC activation. So they are all electrically activated. Disadvantages produce mostly monopolar type of actuation and it requires a high voltage. So high voltage is the real real disadvantage of the system. In comparison to that if I consider the dielectric elastomers like some of the examples I told you uh, in terms of uh, Rondren's initial experiment and the other elastomers they can they actually show large strengths. It can be as large as up to 380 percent much larger than the mammalian skeleton muscles. So that is what is very large. Stress is moderate only several MPa, but still it is comparable with respect to mammalian muscle, large work density and moderate to high bandwidth, not very high bandwidth. This has a very high bandwidth, the field activated groups, low cost, low current and good electromechanical coupling. Now the disadvantage is what is that you need to generate high voltage locally of course typically requires a DC DC conversion compliant and it is quite soft pre-stressing mechanisms add substantial mass and volume because pre-stressing is important in terms of its uh, uh, movement. You remember that the initial Ron James experiment there was a mass that was used to pre-stretch the rubber band. Now there is potential to lower fields using high dielectric materials and based on readily available materials. So this is good one but still it has certain disadvantages. If I consider the ferroelectric polymers then the strain level is less only about 7 percent. Stress is high 45 MPa blocking stress uh, quite high you know much much higher in comparison to this which is in KPA range. Very high work density stiff and strong coupling. It also requires high voltage 
and the cycle life is uh, one of the problem because there is some fatigue that is observed and it has a limited temperature range. So uh, here the lower voltage and fields uh, people are trying to achieve now uh, you know in the ferroelectric polymers and the energy density is in favor and small devices uh, with high frequency is something that is under focus. Let us look into the other group, the ionic polymer group which we have discussed at the end. They have bidirectional actuation and they have bistability and they require low voltage. Now this bistability is a very interesting concept. It means that this kind of structures can have two different stability configurations and it can very fast switch between these two different stability configurations. The disadvantage is that they always require some electrolyte because there is some motion of the ions that has to occur. Voltage requirement is not very high but this electrolyte presence is important under wet condition. Generally that is why it requires a protection from evaporation low electromechanical coupling and specifically for IPMC does not hold strain under DC voltage. For conductive polymers they can generate high stress but strain is moderate low voltage and these are stiffer polymers but they have low electromechanical coupling which means not much of electrical energy will be converted to mechanical energy. They are promising for low voltage applications. Also there are CNTs which require, uh, which gives a high stress, low voltage but the strain is low and IPMCs which actually takes low voltage, very low voltage and large displacement but it has a low coupling still in terms of efficiency and usually it has no catch state that means consumes energy in holding position and requires encapsulation but it has a great potential as bulk material uh, you know properties uh, you know they can be actually improved with individual nanotubes. So this is a comparison between all the different types of these uh, electroactive polymers versus the muscles. So with this lecture I will conclude the smart materials and their applications in terms of the development of organism microbes. In the next series of lectures, we will look into the cognitive aspects of a system and particularly we look into the living system and the cognitive aspect of it. But we will start with say for example, the description of the highest uh, you know, zone in terms of the cognitive capabilities that is the brain itself. So we will discuss about these parts and uh, because that is also a very essential element in an organism's robot development. Thank you.